Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. The growing lack of daycare grabs the attention of state lawmakers and we talk with one senator who is taking the lead in tackling the issue. Plus, a new state law prioritizes efforts aiding prosecution of rape cases and to look at some hidden symbols in our state capitol. Next on Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. According to the findings of the 2017 Legislative Task Force on Access to Affordable Child Care, there are more children in need of care than spaces available to care for them in every region of the state. Senator Bill Weber, chair of the Senate Child Care Access Working Group, joins me to talk more about this. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Two years ago, the Center for Rural Policy and Development called the shortage a quiet crisis. But it seems that it's no longer quiet. It's really become on people's radar. Many bills were proposed last session. Can you briefly outline the problem as you see it? Well, you're right in saying that it's no longer a, a quiet crisis. I think we were aware of it previously, but since last session even, this, this issue has really picked up momentum and steam as, as people have come to us and, and have outlined some of the many problems that, that they're facing. Uh, right now, it's in, uh, I think, in the rural, uh, rural areas especially, it's a question of both access and cost. Uh, it's not like, uh, what option do I wish to choose for my child care provi provider, or who do I wish to, it's, is there a child care provider? I read a headline to... that uh, one woman said she knows who's pregnant in town. She's one of the first people to know because they're calling to see if she has a slot. Oh, that's right. Actually, uh, there are some places that they are committed for infants through the fall of 2020. So in which case, they're, they're not even pregnant yet. It's, it's, it's like it becomes a schedule as to, okay, hopefully everything uh, goes according to plan, you know, and it may or may not. Uh, but that is, that is a very real, very real problem out there. And, and in the metro area, the metro area is not immune from, from the issue. I think we have the same concern, uh, particularly those who do provide uh, family daycare in the home. Uh, you know, the, we're losing people. Uh, we have lost thousands of daycare providers in the last five years. And, uh, and it has created a, a real shortage uh, of, of providers. And uh, again, as we talk about the costs, I know that um, families that have multiple children in daycare centers, uh, in some instances, uh, you know, are paying the equivalent of a, of a uh, college tuition by the time they pay for childcare. And it is a calculation that families have to make whether both parents should continue to work or one parent should drop out of the workforce in order to care for children once there are more than, say, two. That's very true. And, and then when you look at, at workforce shortages, uh, you know, that just compounds additional problems. I think there was a point in time, especially in, in rural Minnesota, where we were thinking about uh, housing, you know, available workers, housing as being the chief problems, but quite frankly, daycare is starting to, uh, starting to take over. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a community in my district, for example, of approximately 1,600 people. Uh, at the end of the school year, they lost four in-home daycare providers. Well, that, you're looking at basically 48 spots. In a community of 1,600, that's really major. So we're talking about both in-home providers and daycare centers, and they are regulated differently, and they're some are, are, are sort of regulated by counties, some are regulated by state agencies. This seems very confusing. Does it need to be simplified? I believe it does. However, um, the daycare centers are that element of, of child care that is licensed and inspected by the state of Minnesota. It is the in-home providers that are licensed and, and inspected by the counties. And uh, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, county's responsible for this, state is responsible for that. Uh, as far as many of the rules, however, a lot of that rulemaking still comes down from the state of Minnesota, from the department, and as a result, um, the rules that the local inspectors are needing to enforce and, and implement are still directed by the state of Minnesota. So what are you hearing from the in-home providers that are closing? As you, you mentioned that thousands have closed in the past, over the past several years. Why are they going out of business? Part of it is a frustration. Um, they, part of it is, uh, some of it they feel is that 
there's been a serious uptake in terms of rule enforcement since they rebuffed the state's attempt to unionize them a few years ago. Uh, they believe that um, you know it has gotten to a point where they're trying to be forced out of business and they're, they're, they're just tired of fighting the battle. Uh, they're looking at the cost of operation that the state is imposing with the rules and regulations and what they're able to uh, earn in terms of supporting their families and uh, the intrusion into their own family's life that, that the daycare has become with the rules and regulations. And, and they're just saying, you know, for us, it, some, it's just not worth it right now. And, uh, and that's really difficult because many of them um, have not been necessarily in the business just for the money. They, they, they just love children. They love taking care of children. Uh, in our, on our family daycare uh, aspect, uh, you know, those daycare providers really in many instances are, are part of the extended family of, of that family. And, and it's really a shame to see this uh, assault on them uh, and, and the problems that they're encountering. The problem affects low and middle income people the most. How much of this is a strain on our economy, in particular because of this workforce shortage that we're experiencing? Well, it's, it's really very large. Um, we have uh, businesses that, that are crying for workers, uh, and, and yet, um, you know, the young families who are going to be the bulk of their workforce uh, just can't necessarily make both spouses available uh, in the workforce if, if they do not have the, the child care availability. Uh, and it's also creating issues, uh, you know, there uh, sometimes the businesses have actually looked at, if they're large enough, have looked at, well, should we try to open a daycare center? That was my next question. And, <laughs> and the reality of it is, is they start to look at the rules and regs and they just throw up their hands and say, we can't deal with this. And, or, you know, or the cost becomes prohibitive. And a couple things as it relates to the daycare centers. In, in my district, for example, we have, uh, we have a couple of daycare centers. But the vast majority of our daycare is provided by the family daycare providers in their, in their homes. Um, you know, uh, as we look at the daycare centers and, and all daycare, uh, we were at a tour uh, of a daycare center in rural Minnesota. And uh, they are completely full. There is a great need in their county. And someone said, well, why aren't you expanding? In their scenario, they have a, they've been given a break on the facilities that they rent, and so financially that's probably about the only way they can actually make it work. And he said, well, we really can't bank on expansion because we can't trust the state. And from the standpoint that if we were to uh, approve universal pre-K for four-year-olds, year for example, in the schools, it would basically financially break the childcare system in Minnesota, whether you're a center or whether you are an in-home provider. So this is an example of Dayton, the Dayton administration's policy of expanding universal pre-kindergarten. It will have an effect on daycare downstream. It, it does. And, and if they lose their four-year-olds, quite frankly, we've lost our entire daycare structure, in my opinion. And, and the other issue is, uh, in my home community, in Rock County is a relatively small county. Uh, but they have identified, they, they believe there's 111 spaces of, in terms of a shortage for daycare. Uh, they've looked at putting together a center and whether they would buy a building and remodel or whether they would build new at an 85% occupancy, they run a loss of $160,000 to $350,000 a year. So at the same time, while there may be businesses that are willing to contribute to this, uh, you know, they have enough trouble with their bottom line the way it is. So exactly how much can they contribute? And, and how big of, uh, of a financial commitment can they afford to make? Senator Weber, I think there's going to be much more discussion on this. I want to thank you for highlighting it today. You're most welcome. Thank you. If you are planning on attending our great Minnesota get-together, be sure to stop by the Senate and House booths in the Education Building to share your opinions and visit with lawmakers. They want to hear from you. You got everybody from all over the state coming in here. We have one of the largest state fairs in the nation, right? I mean, when you talk about population-wise, we always talk about we beat last year's numbers. We beat last year's numbers, right? That every year we seem to beat last year's numbers. But what this does is it gives people a, an opportunity to voice their opinion on some questions that, that actually in the past, and if you talk to some of the folks that have been here for a long time that do these surveys, um, a lot of these survey questions turn into potential bills, which some of them have turned into law. I think at the state fair, we see people from all across the state. And so those of us who come from one district, we get to meet people from Duluth, 
from Mankato, uh, Chatfield, uh, Stillwater, all over the state. And when they come here and come through this booth, um, I talked to somebody actually now from London, here with his parents, and he has roots in Minnesota. So um, that's a very unique thing, and it's important for the legislature to get that very broad exposure for us as legislators, and then also for the staff as well. It's very, very valuable and precious. Just a tremendous source of information to me uh, to learn what's, what's on people's minds. Uh, without having a set agenda, without having a formal atmosphere at the Capitol, where we are in our own community and they can come and talk to their state legislature. There is nothing more important that I do than listen to my constituents. In 2015, Minnesota enacted a law requiring a statewide audit of untested rape kits. The results revealed a backlog of almost 3,500 untested sexual assault exam kits in police storage. A new law will mandate a timetable for the testing of rape kits, and the Senate bill's author, Senator Jerry Ralph, joins me now. Welcome. Thank you. The new law took effect August 1st and will mandate 10 days to obtain a completed sexual assault evidence kit and another 60 days to get it to a laboratory. Is the new law a direct result from the findings of the audit? Uh, yes, it is. And that, that, that we do need, did need some guidelines for police officers in dealing with these, these sexual assault kits. So they were being done, but they were just not being handled properly, and this new law will make it clear that there is now a procedure that should be followed. That's correct. Statewide. The new law also requires that law enforcement will provide assault victims information about their rape kits within 30 days of a written request. Why is this important? Well, there was a gap in the, in the statute that basically a, a sexual assault victim was, not, was unable by law to obtain information from law enforcement as to the status of the kit and in additionally in, uh, as to the status of the investigation. And, Obviously, this is a very delicate area for a person, a, a woman who's been, or man who's been sexually assaulted, and to deny them the information, at least as to respect to whether the kit's been tested, uh, whether any evidence was found, without going into detail, because that could impair the, uh, the actual investigation. That was something we were concerned about, of course, is, is that information that might impair an ongoing investigation not, not be you know, made public or made, made available. But for the victim to be in limbo was just, that, that's traumatic. And so we felt this was something that, that, that needed to be addressed. Go and, ahead. Presu and presumably the victims, uh, just in terms of healing and closure, need to know that what happened is being investigated, correct? And the testimony at the hearing was very clear on this. Uh, the, and her name escapes me, but the lady that came in from the sexual assault uh, advocacy group was very clear on that, that we need to make sure that victims are provided a route for healing and, and a route for dealing with the, the trauma that they've suffered. The law does not specify what should happen when a rape kit is completed, but the victim decides not to report the assault to the police, which I understand is a frequent outcome because of the trauma and the nature of the crime. Is this an area that potentially needs future legislation? Well, I think first of all, to understand there is a requirement in the statute that the, the kit be retained for at least 18 months, which is important because in many cases a victim has to deal with the trauma. This is a difficult time for them and, and, and they may just not want to deal with this. But as time goes on, either new evidence may uh, arise, uh, possibly another assault somewhere else, and the possibility then to have that kit at some point examined needs to be maintained. So as I understand the statute, we, we set up at least a minimum of 18 months uh, to retain these kits so that if something did change, they would be available as an evidentiary uh, piece of material. So as the victim processes it, if they decide, you know, I really do need to go forward mm -hmm. with this, then they'll have that opportunity. Right. And if, that we find that, and if we find that this is an issue, we'll certainly look into it further. Uh, this is something that we need as, as, as judiciary and oversight of, the, of this process, we need to be cognizant of issues on that. And I, I hope and trust the stakeholders involved will come forward if there is an issue. 
There is a caveat in the new law that officers don't have to test the kits if it is believed the results will not add evidentiary value. Are you confident in this language or does it provide officers more discretion than there should be? I believe that most, most peace officers do their job conscientiously. So if they have said that, no, we have, we either we haven't, in other words, the person is in custody, they were caught, there's a guilty plea or anything that would mitigate the necessity for processing it, we certainly don't want to put the, put the counties or the uh, law enforcement to the additional cost. Uh, on the other hand, prosecutorial discretion, is, as, a, as a legislator, I don't want to interfere with that. But if we find that there's a problem, again, that would be something we would want to look at. Uh, but at this point, I don't perceive it as a problem. In July, the Star Tribune began an occasional series called Deny Justice, which looked at rape from a number of, of different angles. The first part pointed out the poor track record for rape investigations across the state. Will this new law move the needle closer to ensuring that victims of sexual assault are taken more seriously? I hope so. I believe that it does provide some standards and guidelines to, to peace officers in, their, in the prosecution of their cases. To, to actually get the evidence and take a look at it. I mean, if a rape kit produces DNA evidence that can be used, that should be something that would motivate the, the, uh, the investigation. And I want to be clear that I believe that our peace officers try and do the, the best job they can. So I don't want to in any way imply that they are not doing their job. And I think this tool will give them at least some guidelines as to the, to the methodology that should be used. Is it possible that the police um that staffing needs to be changed, that there need to be more officers in order to, to follow up on every single rape kit. Um, do departments have enough staff and enough training in dealing with victims of sexual assault to make, is more funding necessary? Okay, well, I think there's two, two aspects to the question. First of all, the, the actual examination of the kit is done at a lab off-site. So in terms of that, other than the fact that they have to send it in, that shouldn't really impact staffing. Uh, in terms of dealing with sexual assault and an, apart and an impact on a department, if their department finds that they need more staff for that, I certainly think that there should be some uh, avenue to do that. Uh, I think the second aspect, and I think you alluded to, was the training. And, the, and, and I think that, again, as a member of the judiciary, we are constantly looking at the police officer standards training, uh, the, what's called the post board, and what they are doing, and if this is a request for something that they need and there's funding available, then we certainly would want to en and encourage it. There are some states that do have a special victims unit or mm -hmm. a certain branch that's devoted simply to sex crimes. Is that something that Minnesota should consider? It's certainly something we could look at. I think it would. Uh, we should first look at how well are things being handled by the local departments. And if, po if it possibly in smaller departments, if they need assistance from the outside, some way to provide that I think would certainly be important. I mean, these are, these are serious cases. We, we certainly can't leave the victims hanging. I mean, we have to, we have to follow up on it. And so uh, whatever mechanism might work, I think that's something we certainly should be open to. Senator Rolf, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Our beautiful state capitol has so many visual treasures making every tour worthwhile. Large to very small architectural details adorn the building on every floor. Here's state capitol historian Brian Pease with more. Minnesota State Capitol has a lot for a visitor to take in, from the art, from the variety of stonework, from the grandeur of the spaces. But for those people that are really interested in details, there's some symbols that they could search for. Can you talk about the symbols in the Capitol? Yeah, sure. The Cass Gilbert, who was the architect of the Capitol, and also uh, Elmer Garnsey was the chief decorator, uh, put all kinds of Minnesota symbols throughout the decoration and a lot of these places you have to look real close because you might walk by them if you've worked here for years for instance if you don't look at the details sometimes you walk by all these symbols for many many years and so you'll see lady slippers and north stars and there are gophers because we're the gopher state and they're interspersed and interlaced in all the decorations throughout the state capitol. There's some threads that tie the outside to the inside in terms of symbols, uh, the letter M and some of the braids of agricultural products. Where are they outside and where are they inside? 
On the outside, you'll see on the exterior, especially around the front entrance, you'll see lion's heads. And when you see a lion's head with its mouth open, it represents authority. And then you'll see above that, you'll see eagles around the dome. And those are represent, of course, eagles from the national government. So we're part of this United States. And then in between the eagles and those columns, you'll see uh, beautiful uh, carved stones of lady slippers. And so those are ringing the dome. So once again, as you're walking up those front steps, you get this idea of the sense of prosperity and progress of the state. You have that gold horses in the front that represents the prosperity and the progress. Plus you'll see wreaths and festoons of products, agricultural products that were an important part of recognizing Minnesota's economy and its wealth from 1900. So if you were to come inside the Capitol and look for eagles, where might you find some eagles? You'll find them everywhere. You can go to the Rathskeller. There are eagles down in the Rathskeller cafeteria. You can go to the ground floor. There are some in the decorations of the pedestals. You'll see them in the first and second floor. You'll see them in just about every chamber. There's a, a representation of an eagle. Once again, establishing the importance of that federal government and the importance of being part of the United States. As you approach the front of the Capitol, there's a letter M on either side. M plays a big part in this Capitol. Yeah, M's are, of course, representing Minnesota. So as that visitor, you want to see that this is Minnesota's state capital. So you'll see letter M's not only in the front of the building, and you'll see them in the railings, in a cipher, they call it. You'll see letter M's even in the points of the star, the North Star, in the rotunda. And you'll see M's all throughout the decorations in the ceilings, the stencil work, and so forth in the house chamber. And once again, what, what Cass Gilbert and Elmer Guernsey are establishing is this is Minnesota state capital. So you always want to remind people Minnesota has uh, all these things that you can learn about or be a part or have that culture and that industry and that agriculture to understand us as a state in 1900. The Lady Slipper, which is Minnesota's state flower, can be found both outside and inside at the top of the columns. Where else can we find the Lady Slipper? If you, as you walk up those front steps, you'll see, you have to look closely because they're quite a distance above you, but in those uh, capitals, the Corinthian capitals, right dead center is the Lady Slipper. And that's also found in the third floor when you look at the top of the capitals throughout the building. Uh, you'll see these lady slippers. And they're in the railing, where there's, there's a third floor railing that you have to stand on the second floor to look up to see those lady slippers. They're in some of the stencil work and the decoration of the house. And so that's once again an important state flower from the 1900s that is still an important part of us recognizing, you know, I think we're the only state that has a pink and white showy lady slipper. So that's a, a, uni a unique decorative detail in the state capitol. Minnesota is known as the Gopher State, and it's because of a railroad scandal that happened in the 1850s. Tell us the story of how Minnesota became to be known the Gopher State. Yeah, that was one of the first big political controversies or scandals in the state's history. And in fact, that all was taking place even before we became a state. Minnesota was given uh, railroad grants from the U.S. government, and they added that grant legislation into a, as a writer to a Gopher and Blackbird eradication bill. And so it was like eradicate gophers and blackbirds and these land grants are given to the state of Minnesota to develop its natural, its, its uh, industrial resources with railroads and so forth. But when we became a state, the constitution said we could only borrow $250,000. And in order to build the railroads, the investors were saying we need more money. So they changed the constitution just a few months after it was adopted to make that loan agreement to five million dollars. And so what happened is they gave grants and money to all these uh, different railroad agencies and then there was a huge economic depression. Sucked out all the investments out of Minnesota and so for that five million, million dollars there wasn't one mile railroad built. So that was a political scandal. So there was a St. Paul druggist, a cartoonist who drew up a cartoon showing the railroad men dressed as gophers trying to influence the people and they were pulling a car full of legislators to the end of a railroad track that went to the Slough of Despond which is a Pilgrim's Progress reference and so it's basically you know the railroads being held up by the backs of uh, legislators who were bribed so that the, the heaviness of the gold sacks are pulling them down and the railroads built on top of them so that cartoon was pretty popular and that's how we became known as the Gopher State. And so where can those gophers be found in this building? They're once again like stars, not 
as common, but you'll see them in the same railings. You'll see the uh, lady slippers and the eagles. You'll see them uh, carved in the house uh, retiring room, which is not available to the public, unfortunately, but there's a, a two little gophers sitting on their hind legs there. Those are the same things you'll see in the railings. They're also found in the gates. And those were added in the 1970s outside the chambers. And so you'll see them on their hind legs at the top of the gates. And so that's kind of a, a fun way of bringing in, you know, what Minnesota was recognized for even in 1900 was the Gopher State and the North Star State. Well, let's talk about the North Star because at the very top of the dome, uh, it's adorned with uh, zodiac symbols. Do those carry any special significance? Yeah, they're representing more of the stars, the constellations. So the idea that Gilbert was trying to create was as you're standing in the first floor of the rotunda where there's a large North Star emblazoned in, in marble but also in, in brass and glass, if you look up you'll see you know, these, these signs of the zodiac which would be the stars above. And then some people say that large chandelier could be seen as a North Star as well because that's a guiding light. And that was the idea that Henry Sibley wanted when he came up with that model for the brand new state of Minnesota in 1858 is we're the northernmost state at that time and plus a, a North Star is a light that people can follow. And so the idea is follow our lead as a new state. So there's a lot of detail to be discovered in the capital. How much of this is pointed out in a tour? Yeah, a lot of it is uh, something that is first and foremost as people walk through the spaces and the tour guides are very good at, at pointing out some of those little clever details um, depending on, on the type of group on uh, the type of stories that guide might be talking about because we don't ha really have a scripted tour each guide will have some different things and nuances they'll put into their tours to make it unique and individual but yeah you'll see uh, obviously that north stars in the rotunda you might point out the gophers in the railings and the lady slippers and you'll see all kinds of uh, the agricultural products just as you walk through the building. And so the spaces the tour groups go to pretty much hit all these, these areas where you can, as that viewer, kind of ingest all that agricultural products that you see as a visual uh, reminder throughout the building. Was it common practice when, when this capital was being designed and built to have this level of detail found throughout a building like this? Yeah, I think in this time period, what you're creating is this Italian Renaissance style building. And so you're bringing some of those uh, decorative elements and details into the building. So the arabesques, which would be on the first floor stencils, are very uh, kind of flowers and products of the state. And if you went to Italy, it might be a different type of decor there because they're, you know, promoting what they have to offer, whereas Cass Gilbert and Elmer Garnsey made the decorations here very Minnesota focused. So you're going to see corn more than you would say apples or grapes in some other you know, location in other parts of the United States or, or Europe. And so that's what makes the building really neat to look at is it's an it's a Italian Renaissance inspired building but it has to represent Minnesota's values and its history and its economy as, at the same time. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.